How old are you, Mr. Woodcock? I'm 83 years old, ma'am. And how long have you been incarcerated on this charge? <clears throat> I've been um, locked up for 43 years. And that, that's, that's the same information that I have, that you were 40 years old when um, you were arrested for this crime. You have been incarcerated for 43 years, and now you're 83. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Now, who was the victim in this case? Mr. Armin Cole. And who was Mr. Armin Cole to you? Mr. Armin Cole was married to my sister, Betty Cole. And uh, so he was your brother in law, is that correct? Um, yes, ma'am. One I didn't really know. Well, but in fact, he was your brother in law, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. How long had your sister been married to Mr. Cole? I uh, don't know, ma'am. Your sister was also charged in connection with Mr. Cole's death. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. She was convicted of conspiracy and she received a 20 year sentence. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Mr. Woodcock, would you please tell us uh, what happened in this case? How did you come uh, to take Mr. Cole's life? Tell us what happened. Well, during that time, I was under the uh, influence of alcohol. Plus, I had medical problems with uh, my ex-wife. Stop, stop talking right there. What do you mean medical problems with your ex-wife? She was saying to a psychiatrist and um, I, I was saying the same thing. You would, you would want... And it was a, a problem with uh, with her being a um, stealing money. All right. So what did that have to do with your committing this crime? That comes from um, me and uh, my fall partner, Paul, John Paul Fallon. And it was a conspiracy between the two of us that I would take and uh, kill his father-in-law and he would take and kill uh, Mr. Cole. And why would you want to kill Mr. Cole since you say you barely knew him? Why would you be interested in killing your brother-in-law? It was an agreement between myself and Paul Fallon. His father-in-law was retired from the railroad people in um, Pennsylvania, and he had a lot of money. And Paul Fallon wanted it, and he. Between the two of us, we figured we could make some money out of it. Even if we had to take and borrow it for my sister, for me, and he would take and get it from his wife. I'm so, uh, okay, let's stop for just a moment because you've lost me because none of this is making a lot of sense to me. 
Who wanted your brother-in-law killed? I didn't understand. She, she's asking you about the conspiracy with Betty wanting her husband killed. It, it, um, not necessarily what I would consider a conspiracy between myself and my sister, but it come down to it that uh, I was acting on information from her that she was telling me about uh, her husband, Aubrey Cole. And what was and that? that what was that information? Um, abuse, alcoholism, and also um, molesting um, young girl. So uh, your sister made those accusations against the victim. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. And so why did that lead you to taking his life? It was a deal between me and uh, Paul Fallon. It was a simple deal where he would do something and I would do something and would both gain from that actions of each other. Well, again, I don't understand what Mr. Fallon had to do with your killing his brother-in-law and what you had to gain from Mr. Fallon uh, killing his stepfather or whoever, father-in-law or whoever. You know, I don't understand how those are connected. But we'll we'll move on. So how did you kill Mr. Uh, Cole? Um, used a twenty-five automatic, well, that's, twenty-five caliber. Well, just tell us what happened. Where was he when you killed him? What are the circumstances? Tell us how you took his life. What did you say? She wants you to explain the circumstances of the murder. Tell her what happened that day that you killed Mr. Cole. That's what she wants you to tell her. Well, what happened was we were drinking and uh, decided to go hunting over in um, West Mississippi at the... Um, At a government installation over there. Um, we were drinking. We went to New Orleans, drank some more, and we was gonna. I was gonna take and borrow a rifle, a certain kind of rifle, which was a Henry forty four forty, and uh, the person that had it was Mr. Armand Cole, and he had it down in his basement. When we got to the house, he said, yeah, come on in. And uh, he went downstairs, and we were up and back up. Uh, who did you, who were you drinking with? John Paul Fallon. Okay, so you and Mr. Fallon went to Mr. Cole's house. Correct? Yes, ma'am. And what happened when you got to Mr. Cole's house? He knocked on the door and he comes to it and, uh, and asked us what we were doing. And we uh, tell him over here drinking and want to borrow the rifle, uh, the 4440, Henry. And uh, he said, yes. Sure, come on. And they turned and went down the stairs. And um, I flipped out. Well, 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 when are you flipped out? Aggravation. About what? 
about my way of life and also about my problems. Not only was I having problems with my wife, but I had problems with society as a general principle. Um, I found out I made a very serious mistake when I retired at the Marine Corps. And, uh, We're going to talk about that in a minute. But uh, you said that the reason you killed your brother-in-law was that your sister had told you some pretty bad things about Mr. Yes, ma'am. Oh, and now you're telling us, oh, I just flipped out because my life was not going well. So which one is it? Both. Uh, your sister was charged along with you. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am, she was. And the allegation was that the murder was committed for the insurance money on Mr. Cole. It had nothing to do with any abuse. It had nothing to do with any issues you were having. It was committed because there was a life insurance policy on Mr. Cole, and you all wanted to get the money. Yes, ma'am. My sister received the money, and um, it was one of those things where I could borrow anything and money from her, and it was to be it's basically the same thing for Paul Fallon. I was to do him a favor by killing his father-in-law. Okay. All right. So let's talk a little bit. Uh, you were uh, in the military. Yes, I am. And you had two stints in the military. Is that correct? Say again, ma'am. You had two stints in the military. You had two different stints in the you military. You were in the Army and then you were in the Marines. I was in the Army and the Marines. Yes, ma'am. Okay, that's what I'm trying. Three years in the Army okay. back in the 50s. And then I joined the Marine Corps and finished it out 20 years. Okay. Okay, let's stop talking. Stop talking. So you uh, did your, whatever your commitment was to the Army. And you were discharged from the army. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. How long after that did you join the Marine Corps? Uh, approximately a year, maybe a little more. And what made you join the Marine Corps? What made you go back into the military? That was the safest place for me. And um, I like the idea of what I was going to do in the Marine Corps, which is reconnaissance work. Um, well, well, let's was, go back. Why did you think that was the safest place for you to be? I had a, <clears throat> I've had a, a friend of mine that was in the Marine Corps, plus I had my, uh, one of my cousins. And I knew some people that had been in the Corps and got out. Um, my attitude was ideal for me would be in the Marine Corps because I could take and go to different schools um, and enjoy the training that I would have to do from uh, Boot camp until I retired. Okay, so how long were you in the Marine Corps? 17 years, ma'am. Okay, and you uh, had the rank of E7? 
east of it, just about. And then you retired due to alcohol and family issues. Tell us about that. Why, why did you end up retiring from the Marine Corps? Well, I've been drinking for four or five years while I was in the Corps. And um, I was having a problem with my ex-wife. And she was seeing a psychiatrist. Plus, um, I caught her in a, a lot of lies. And it wasn't good for the children. She had uh, three girls of her own, and I had two sons. So it was five children. Okay. Well, wh what part did alcohol play in your retirement? As you mentioned, alcohol. So yes. What part yes. did alcohol play in your retirement? It influenced my decisions. One was I didn't want the children to be left hanging because of my ex-wife. And I I decided to get out so that I could be there. And uh, once I got out of after... Um, so let me ask you this. Did your drinking cause any problems in the Marine Corps? Did your drinking cause you to have any problems with the Marine Corps? No, ma'am. Okay. All right. Well, let's uh, fast forward um, and talk about uh, how you have spent the last 43 years. Um, I, I noticed that you only have had two disciplinary write-ups in 43 years, which is um, uh, very commendable. Your last write-up was almost 30 years ago in 1994. Do you remember what that was for? Yes, ma'am. What was that about? It was, uh, I was working in the mattress factory as the clerk and they had a new man to come in that my boss wanted him to know what the paperwork was like and what he had to do. But he had a problem that he was trying to be a good guy to everybody and he took and uh, just took my uh, coffee pot, coffee, and was giving it away. And I tried to take and explain it to him that um, that's not the way it's done. And being in the penitentiary, you cannot allow anyone to take anything from you. And at that time, which was back in 1994, it was still... Um... So what did you do to get a write-up? Well, I they put it down as a fight. It was one blow thrown. It was him. And uh, he didn't throw any more of them. And uh, finally, he listened to me talking to him. And uh, when I was talking to him, the security guard come in and he put it down as uh, we were fighting. Okay, so it was for a fight. That was the write-up you got was for fighting, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Well, let's talk about some of the programs you have taken. Uh, 
Tell us about what, what <laughs> programs have you taken to address your drinking? As soon as uh, I got to the penitentiary in 1984 and the first of 1985, I joined the uh, AA group at Maine Prison. Went through the steps and everything like that. And um, and after being an alcoholic, and I, I made an honest inventory of myself and realized that I needed help. And, um, to, and I moved forward. I, I also learned that AA isn't just about me. It's helping someone else. Um, when did you when did you when did you participate in AA? In 1985. For how long? About um. The the reason I'm asking about six years. I I don't I might have overlooked it, but I don't see any documentation of AA participation. Um, I, I don't see that in the file, okay? I'm just pointing that out. I show that you've taken Cage of Rage. Yes, ma'am. That was in 17, Thinking for a Change in 18, Victim yes. Awareness in 19, Pre-Release phase one and two in 2023. Does that sound about right? Yes, ma'am. Um, and um, the 100 hours covered pretty, um, alcohol. Well, and not in depth. Uh, not in depth. Why? Why is there such a long gap between the time you came to prison and the time you started taking classes. It's like you didn't really get started with classes until 2017. Why is that? I was with, I joined the um, Veterans Organization in Maine Prison. <coughs> And also the other ones, um, Camp C and then the Camp F. I, I see that you've been involved in clubs, but what I'm I'm looking at is it looks like up until 2017 you hadn't really taken any kind of programs, and I'm trying to find out uh, why you. Been, you know, over 30 years in prison before you started taking programs. That's because it was made available to me at that time, and I had time for everything before that. I was working at a job. Given, given uh, your situation, you didn't think it would be better to take something, some programs that would help you? Um, try to figure out what got you there and to make sure you don't make some of the same choices again. I'm just concerned about your lack of participation in any substance abuse programs. Not living in balance, not uh, I, I, you know, celebrate recovery. I'm just not seeing any work being put in to dealing with the problem with drinking. I well, know that, I know I didn't hear you. I said, ma'am, I dealt with that problem when I first got there. And I learned what I had to do, who I had to talk to, and how I had to take it, uh, come down on myself 
and to be um, hard, make a harder decisions. And I wasn't under the influence of alcohol and I haven't had a drink in over 43 years. Tell me about victim awareness. I don't need to know um, when you took it. I just need to know what did you learn from it? Well, I, I realized I had to be more considerate about what my victim's family and his, uh, his friends and my family and my friends and uh, associates um, taking responsibility for my own actions, no matter what they are and what they relate you to. Let me ask you this. What do you think, how do you think your actions affected Mr. Cole's family and his friends? Tell me about that. Well, I had the opportunity to speak to his two, two children. Um, right. In. His daughter and his son. The, um, and they explain how they felt and how they had reacted at that time of the uh, I of the but even before that Mr. Uh, Wilcock you didn't give any thought to what you did and how you hurt so many people yes ma'am sure I have every day of my life so what From what what are your thoughts I thought it was, I had to change and I had to become no, a partner no. on myself. Your thoughts about the Coles family. Tell me what your thoughts have been about the Coles family. Well, I had tried to figure out what they were uh, thinking and if um, just what they were going through at that time or even well, since then. You said you tried to figure it out. So what did you figure out about what they were feeling and thinking? Excuse me, ma'am. I didn't understand. She, she asked you what you figured out about what the Coles were going through because of the murder. I figured out that um, it affected them uh, psychologically, mentally, and physically. Um, it affected their their grandmother and their grandfather, uh, their mother, and the sisters and brothers of the Cole family. Um, I knew it was a very difficult time for them, you know, um, having um, not having the opportunity to have a conversation with him or be with him or enjoy their time together. Warren, uh, what information can you give us about Mr. Woodcock? You know, since, since he first came here to us in, in 1984, um, he did, in fact, work. And he worked various jobs uh, for us throughout the 80s, 90s. He worked print shop, uh, mattress factory, and did some maintenance for us, plumbing crew. The uh, the last, probably looking at it, from 2004 until just, just a couple of years ago, we'll say in 15, he went to the clothing room, but he worked for us in the rifle range. So he has had jobs with us 
that have been jobs with responsibility, uh, especially around the rifle range where we have we had live rounds, we had guns constantly there. Uh, he worked around there. We never had any problems with him in that respect. Um, and it wasn't until getting into 17, 18, when he started working at Camp F in the clothing room for us. Uh, you know, from the standpoint of his medical right now, he does have several underlying comorbidities uh, related to um, chronic kidney disease, uh, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, uh, diabetes, glaucoma. So right now, as well as his job that he does have, he's got frequent uh, specialty clinic appointments through neurology, uh, nephrology, and cardiology. All right, uh, thank you. Mr. Woodcock, uh, I see that you have a walker. Uh, why do you have to have a walker? I have three vertebrae in my lower back. The top one and the bottom are squeezing the one in between. And um, it's affecting my nerves. And my left leg doesn't work very often because of that. And um, I've been to the doctors to see about it, the x-ray had an epidural and um so you have you have a compressed disc. Yes ma'am. Okay and what about your diabetes? Is it under control? Your that? diabetes is it under control? As far as I know I don't have diabetes. Oh, okay. So it's a warning. I don't take no medicine or uh, that's fine. Don't take any medicine. And when did you develop any hearing issues? Um I've had the hearing issue for maybe almost 10 years. All I've been right. going to the doctor and they'll um give me a test. I have been to New Orleans to the hospital down there where they put you in the um, enclosed booth and the headphones All right. and uh, different nice. different tones. Okay, that's fine. Um, I show that you have an aortic aneurysm, glaucoma, uh, and then it says pre-diabetes. So. You haven't officially crossed over into diabetes, but you have pre-diabetes. So if you were to be successful, Mr. Woodcock, I know that the parole project has indicated their willingness to extend their services to you in the short term, but in the long term, what's your plan? Well, my plan is to take advantage of uh, the parole project, if, if it's possible, to learn uh, more about society and what is required for an individual. As for uh, a place to live, I have my sister who lives in Mobile, Alabama, along with her children, and she has offered to allow me to stay with her and she's a registered nurse. So I am one of my things about medical problems is as soon as I can, I will go to the VA hospital and try to get something done. And uh, at least they'll take it, do all kind of tests on me and they'll make up their mind whether I can uh, qualify for an epidural or a, a laser. Okay. Uh, well, I just, I didn't mean specifically your health, but just in general, how are you going to um, be able to live and support yourself or be supported? 
Uh, have you ever been diagnosed with any kind of mental health issue? Yes, ma'am. A long time ago. Um, Nineteen fifty-seven, uh, in the army, I had to go see a psychiatrist. Why? Also, um, why? Just why? Why? Uh, I had an uh, argument with a uh, another uh, recruit, and. They broke up the fight before we could throw in the blows. I like that. But um, he had to go see the psychiatrist, and so did I. And um, I guess it was just uh, I, I, don't think that, I don't think that they just send you this. I mean, I'm sure recruits fight all the time. I don't think that's anything that's unusual. So why would they think that you needed to see a psychiatrist? Um, Ma'am, I couldn't tell you that. That's an army. Um, they do things different than is civilians. That, is that the only time you've seen a psychiatrist or been treated for any mental health issues? Um, no, ma'am. In 19... 62, while I was in a boot camp in the Marine Corps, um, they saw this in my record and they wanted to know what it was about. And they called me in for um, observation and a discussion. And then after that, uh, I didn't have to go back at all. Wow. Uh, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Woodcock. I appreciate it. <clears throat> Your nod to that's all I have. All right, thank you. Um, Mr. Woodcock, we're going to hear from the folks who want to speak in support. So first, could we hear from Ms. Faith Dye? You want to step up to the front of the What'd she say? Faith is going to speak. Oh. Um, just really wanted this whole thing down to be over with. Um, memories were remorseful. And he's 83 years old. And I think he's been in prison long enough to see him get out. To live some of his life in London there. What is your relationship to him, Miss Guy? To that's my uncle. Yes. Thank you. Mr. Weatherford. And my name is Alan Weatherford. And, um, just want to take just a few minutes there to speak to y'all. Mr. Right. Weatherford, tell us your relationship. That is a uh, mom and uh, George Woodcock's mom. I had worked in law enforcement for 39 years, seven years as chief of police and governor, retired in 20 years. 13, uh, but I continue to work in law enforcement. I work closely with the Mississippi Department of Correction under the Interstate Compact Act previously. Uh, and I do appreciate and understand the important role that you all do. But uh, I just want to speak briefly about my uncle, George Wilcox. You know, when I was 11 and 12 years old, I remember him coming home and, and looking at him and his uh, Marine uh, uniform and and, and, and was trying to decide if that's something I wanted to do. Uh, but uh, of course, uh, you know, talking to him and, and, and he had that rough, you know, tough, uh, what I call the Marine outlook uh, there, uh, the Marine Corps side of it. And of course, uh, he was just a serious man. And uh, he had a great sense of humor uh, with uh, nieces and nephews and as a youngster, I was shocked when he was arrested. I was sad. That was me. I didn't talk to George for about 10 years. And uh, 
because of me being mad and disappointed. Uh, I started visiting George in uh, Angola, and over the years, I've been able to develop a relationship. What you saw today here is not George Woodcock. When it took me, because I've been in law enforcement, it took some time to build a relationship with uh, George uh, there. Uh, if he's in a group of people, he's not going to say much. He's going to get nervous. Talk to him one on one there. So it took some time to build a relationship with him and, and over the years and, and see the respect that he, uh, others had, guards and, uh, and the other trustees that was there, uh, there at Angola. So in 20, probably about 2013, was probably when I had a good discussion with George. And I don't know if he recalls that discussion that we had, but we had one at Lee. In 2011, our, our daughter was killed by a drunk driver. And the defendant pled guilty and was sentenced to 25 years. It turned my world around there. Uh, it's from the victim side. Now I realize what homicide uh, victims' families were going through, the emotions, the grief, that side. Uh, so I started talking to George uh, regarding what I was going through and what this young man had killed our daughter and, and being sentenced. Uh, and opening his eyes to the grief that he had caused Faye uh, and the Cole family there, and not just them, all our family there. I think that opened his eyes. I think that was a, an opportunity, and maybe that was the timing uh, there. It, it, it was just, but I could say this to Faith and to the Cole family, and to y'all, one-on-one, over time, building a relationship, and they're able to trust me and, and me trust him and talk to him, that he is remorseful. He does not do very well there. He's hard of hearing. You have to repeat things there. Uh, but it just, it, it's, but he, his record, I think, speaks for itself. Two write-ups there. Um, just asking for consideration, served 43 years. He has strong family support. Uh, and I, I'll say this to you, it's on a professional level there. If I had any concerns about public safety, I would not be standing here today. I wouldn't be standing here today. I would offer him a place to stay on my property there if he didn't have a place to go. But uh, what you see of uh, George today, is not the George that I know over the years. And I was able to talk to the young man that killed our daughter. He is now out. I did not oppose him getting out because I was able to speak to him there. So I say to Faith, also Dad, to the whole family, I'm sorry that we're all having to go through this there. And just hopefully there's a consideration there. That much respect for everybody in this room. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you And I believe um, I didn't go. We have Chris Thompson. Is that right, Mr. Oops. Lancaster? Maria, Maria Thompson, Ms. Renata. Maria. I'm sorry. Thank you. you want to see she could actually just sit right where she's at. We okay. can see her on the screen and we'll be fine. Okay. Hello, my name is Maria Thompson. And I'm uh, George's niece. He's my mother's brother. Um, she was supposed to speak today, but she was unable to attend due to a short-term ailment that uh, she's been treated for. Uh, therefore, I'm going to speak for the family, and I'm going to incorporate some of her words. Uh, I thank you as members of the board for the dedication to this important decision. I know it's hard for you. My purpose today is to assure you that it would not be a mistake to release my uncle back into society. He's been in prison for 43 years. And since the purpose of prison is for rehabilitation and punishment, we believe that there's evidence that he's met both of those. 
and the specific details are in your packet, so I'm not going to take your valuable time to repeat the information you've already reviewed. Since my uncle was incarcerated, he's had continuous support from his family members and will always have that support from this large network of family. And if he's released, he'll live with my mother, who is a registered nurse, having served in many roles in critical care, quality assurance, and as the director of nursing out of a large hospital. She, she'll see that he receives the best of care. Um, she, and she has a good support system from myself, my husband, uh, my brothers and sister, my sister lives next door, and uh, many other nieces and nephews in Alabama and Mississippi area. And he'll never go out with the resources he needs. Um, over the year, he's, he's expressed great remorse and regret for his actions to us. And we truly believe that he's not the same person as he was when he was 38 year old man when this crime was committed. Uh, we'd love to see him be able to come home and spend what years he's got left with his loved one. Uh, his sons would love to have some time with their father that they greatly missed because they were six and seven years old when they were separated from him. And the two siblings he has left would love to be able to finally see him come home as well. And again, I thank you for the work you do as a board, and I thank you for your time. Thank you. We appreciate it. Okay. All right. Um, we'll hear from the opposition now. Um, for those of you who are here, I don't know who wants to go first. I'll let you choose. Uh -oh. Hi, my name is Charlene Paul Roth. My dad is awesome, brother. My dad changed. I made that morning. I didn't have to go identify that body. <laughs> it's not been the same. My mom and dad have both passed. And my sister and I. Said that we were going to carry this on as long as it meant. I didn't get out. My mom, through her dementia, always, always was scared that somebody was going to find her and hurt her also. And that's why we're here today, so that it's not allowed to happen to anybody else and have their family go through what our family has gone through. My grandmother, my grandfather died not long after my uncle. My grandfather was destroyed, tempted, buried the son. And not long after that, my grandmother couldn't deal with it anymore. So that's why I'm here today for my family, because my uncle doesn't get the chance to see the light of day again to spend another moment with his family. Thank you. My name is Pam, and Army Cole was my dad. And in 1978, in December of 1978, four days before Christmas, I received a phone call at my job from my grandfather telling me that my daddy was killed. I think that was the worst day of my life, of my family's life. Even though my mother and father were divorced for many, many years, he was still my dad. He did not deserve what he got. Like Charlene says, my grandmother and my grandfather died before they ever got to see my daddy's killer brought to justice. In 1982, George Woodcock was sentenced to first degree murder for the killing of Armin Cole. He received a life sentence the rest of his natural life. No benefit of parole, 
pardon, or suspension of sentence. I understand that George is 83 years old. I understand that he has served 43 years in prison. But my daddy's been dead for 45. He never got a chance in life to live to be 83 years old. That was taken away from him. He was taken away from me. He was taken away from my family. My family highly opposes his commutation. We feel that my daddy and my grandparents should be able to rest in eternal peace. Please, please deny George Woodcock commutation. Thank you. Thank you. And um, Mr. Scott Cole. Bowling. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, there's a wrong motion. <laughs> It's a couple of things. We're here if, to see if George is rehabilitated. And that, that's the big question. I, believe. And, uh, I mean, in his own words, in his applications, he's mentioned, I, I hear that his sister is a nurse. I mean, the guy is admitting that he's under psychiatric care with a nurse. I would imagine he's being medicated. He, we were told we can't say anything after meeting with him, but he admitted that he got the bus. So I'm going to say, um, he says he suffers from paranoia and that this paranoia started at age 15. So we don't have files that maybe you have there. Uh, but my concern is that there may still be a psychiatric issue going on. And if you read the timeline of this guy's life, it's like this guy seems to do better when he's in a controlled environment. From 1940 to 1956, he was under parental control. At 16, he ran away and dropped out of school. From 57 to 60, he was in a controlled environment. He was in the army. He gets out of the army in 60. His first crime is a burglary. 61, you know, because of his burglary. Yeah, somehow he joined the Marines in 61, 76. He tells us that he was retired out of the Marines. But I believe in the files that our family was able to access it. He didn't put this on his applications, but he committed a crime in 76, two crimes, burglary in Hawaii. He was under investigation for that. And a third crime, conspiracy to commit. And I believe that the Marines didn't want it. And I heard what he said again today about his ex-wife, Connie. And you just children are hearing this other from start. But you don't retire from the Marines on an $800 pension back in 1976 and think you're going to support five children because she had mental illness. Right? She divorced him. Right? He paid child support out of that pension. It truly was. And I think the drinking, he admits it, he says right here. Uh, I served in Vietnam, Germany, and other world. I retired from the military in 76 because of family problems. That's what he said today. And my drinking became increasingly worse when I returned to civilian life. We're determining today if this guy is capable of returning to civilian life. So the two crimes in 76, and then murders our father in 78. And then He's arrested in 80. Yeah, sobriety. He quit because he can't have a drink, right? And 
He hasn't even gone through the steps of sobriety. Thank you for asking the question. You talk about sobriety and what did you learn? I don't think you learned anything. So it, this was hard for me. I told my sister, I can't, you know, they want me to make a decision. Can this guy get out? And I want to be fair. But the more that I delved into this guy's life, it's like, He's shown no remorse to us. We were told by Gail Gaynor, he can't contact us. Well, you know what his attorney could contact us. Somebody could send us a letter and say, I'm sorry. His brother-in-law says he met with George and he has been a victim. And he's saying he's remorseful. You know, words have meaning. And we've never heard the words. We met with them on Friday. My sister had to say, a two and a half hour meeting. Are you sorry? And his first response was, I'll tell you at the end. So I don't think he's rehabilitated. I don't think sobriety has worked for him. And you know what I think is going to happen? And if he does get out, I'll never know. But I think he's going to have a drink. And I think if he gets off of his medications, Elderly people can still stab people or kill them. He tells me in his application he wants to go to the VA groups and to the AA groups. I'll tell you, there aren't model citizens in these groups. And if he can be influenced by someone or if he can influence someone, I mean, that would be an awful thing. But it's like I said, we can't determine what the, what's in this guy's mind and heart. All we have to do is ask him questions and see what's in those applications. And so today I say, as much as it's hard, this guy needs to stay in a controlled environment. And I think it needs to be within a situation like he's in now. I mean, I realize he's old. My heart goes out to his family. But it's like my sister and my cousin said, our father's not here. He never got to be old. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cohen. All right, um, Mr. Woodcock, is there anything you want to say to the board before we turn it over to Mr. Lancaster? Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon, members of the board. I would like to thank you for giving me this opportunity to appear before you today. I have been incarcerated for 43 years for killing Mr. Armand Gold. I have had many years to reflect on the pain and suffering I has caused Mr. Armand Cole's family. I deeply regret my actions that night. Since my incarceration, I have grown old and matured as well. I am not the same man I was 44 years ago, I worked until I have some major medical issues. I have participated in a number of programs. I have learned to be a better person than I was 44 years ago. I believe I have done everything possible to ensure my change and growth while incarcerated. And I thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Lancaster. Thank you. Um, Mr. Woodcock came to Angola in 1982 um, at a time, well, 1984, at a time in which many of the programs that uh, people come before the board uh, today um, didn't have available early on in his incarceration. He did in 1985 participate uh, fully in Alcoholics Anonymous. There is a certificate. I, I understand from Ms. Jackson's questions that there was no information about that in the official packet, but in the information that I submitted, uh, there is a certificate of his completion of Alcoholics Anonymous at that point. Um, he did work the 12 steps. He then uh, focused on work. If you look at Mr. Woodcock's uh, job assignments throughout the period of his incarceration, he worked consistently. Uh, and in uh, positions of trust, in positions of responsibility, 
as the warden mentioned, he worked for an extended period of time in the rifle range, uh, which is a position of tremendous trust given uh, the, the nature of that work being around guns, life, firearms. Uh, it's also a place in which um, uh, you folks are, are trained uh, and uh, Mr. Woodcock was given that uh, position of trust. Uh, he's been at Camp F uh, for a very long period of time. That's the trustee camp. He's been a class A trustee, I think for over 30 years. Um, and uh, you know, he has been institutionally compliant. I know there were some questions of his write-ups. As mentioned, he only has two. Uh, his first one, um, I think only resulted in a sentence of five days. And the second one, uh, the fight that was mentioned, that sentence was actually suspended. Um, so um, based on uh, his success in prison um, and uh, his, his completion of, of, of programs, uh, we would request that this uh, board rec re uh, recommend uh, clemency uh, for Mr. Woodcock. Um, I know that there are um, you know, considerable questions about you know, this crime. The state's theory behind this crime was that it was a murder for hire, three co-defendants, uh, Mr. Woodcock's sister, uh, John Paul Fallon. Uh, you know, John Paul Fallon uh, was granted immunity uh, for turning state's evidence. And so much of the facts that came out at trial, much of the facts that are in the official record uh, were facts that really came from uh, Mr. Fallon. Uh, in that he was really the principal uh, witness uh, in this case, having uh, turned state's evidence uh, for that testimony. Um, the other point uh, that I would just like to make, and this is really goes to the importance of clemency. Uh, at the time that Mr. Woodcock was sentenced for first degree murder, uh, the, the sentence of life in prison was a mandatory sentence. Uh, the judge didn't have the ability uh, nor even the facts of the ability for Mr. Woodcock to rehabilitate himself um, and, and change over the years. And the important thing about clemency is that it does offer people the opportunity who did receive sentences of life without the opportunity for parole uh, to have some consideration about their development over their period of incarceration. And Mr. Woodcock's 43 years of incarceration is one that demonstrates that uh, he is compliant with the rules. Uh, he is compliant with his medical treatment. Uh, it would continue to do so should he be released. He's gonna be surrounded. If he is released, he has an out-of-state plan to go to Alabama uh, where he will live with his sister right next door as a niece, uh, just a few uh, uh, blocks away or other family members. Uh, so he will be surrounded by support um, family also is around the Mississippi Gulf Coast. Uh, Mr. Weatherford will be available to assist as well. Uh, he'll also, you know, participate in, uh, um, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous uh, once he's out. And the reason for that primarily is that he does understand that that transition is one that uh, will be different from uh, his experience in prison, and he will utilize that support structure uh, to continue to maintain his sobriety. Uh, so uh, with the uh, information that's presented at the hearing today, uh, we request that he uh, gain a recommendation for consideration of clemency. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Oh, I'd like to ask for an executive section. Sure. We have a motion by Mrs. Jackson and a second by Mr. Roche for executive section to discuss confidential matters. Can you do a roll call, please? Uh, Ms. Jackson? Yeah. Mr. Roche? Yes. Mr. Renatza? Yes. Mr. Marabella? Yes. Mr. Freeman? Yes. All right. So stand by. We'll be in executive session to discuss confidential matters. We'll be back shortly. Okay. 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 Okay, we are back in regular session. Prepare to vote. 
Mrs. Jackson will be voting first. <clears throat> first, I'd like to thank all of our participants here today um, and those who are at prison. Um, and I want you to know that we've taken information every week. We don't disregard anybody's um, feelings or opinions. And so I'd like to thank the online family for your input, as well as the supporters of Mr. Woodcock. These are all different cases. Mondays suck because Monday is always hard day. And so you know, they're always really different cases. And we take our responsibility very seriously. I assure you of that. Um, I want to start by saying, um, particularly to Mr. Alnan's son, you don't carry the burden of responsibility of the city. That's not on your shoulders. That's not on any of your shoulders. That's on our shoulders. We took on this responsibility and we carry the weight of it. So I want you to lift that up off your shoulders. It does not rest on you. Uh, our responsibility is to look at a lot of factors. We do look at the crime, and they're all bad. They've all caused harm that continues. But the offender can't control what mm -hmm. he's done in the past or the crime. That boy, I mean, the only thing that they can do is move forward. And our responsibility is to look at that particular person and answer for ourselves do we think this person can be released to society? And we look at a lot of factors. Uh, among those are, you know, what has he done over the last 43 years or 30 years or however long that person has been incarcerated? what is the disciplinary record look like. Uh, how does the institution regard them? What, what level of trust do they put in that individual? And whether or not that person uh, is going to be released with some sort of safety in place. And so those are the factors that I look at personally, and we all have our own, you know, very, importance that we give to each one. So I want you to know that we don't take these decisions like at all. As I examine Mr. Woodcock's case, I'll say Mr. Woodcock did not interview well today, but not everybody does. And I, we learn to accept that. Some people are very glib speakers, but you know they're not ready. And then you have people like Mr. Woodcock who really doesn't present very well. And so you look at, well, how has he conducted himself over the last 43 years? You know, maybe that speaks more for him than this window that we get today. And so as I've looked at Mr. Woodcock, uh, I feel that he is. Um, rehabilitated, even though he may not articulate it uh, as well as I would like. I look at the fact that uh, for 43 years, he's only had two write-ups. We've had people with hundreds of write-ups. Uh, he has held a position of trust within the institution. They don't let anybody be around the gun range. There has to be a level of trust that they have in him. Uh, he has the support of the Louisiana Parole Project, so that if a governor should choose to uh, sign a commutation, uh, he would go to the Louisiana Parole Project to be reacclimated into society. Things have changed in 43 years in uh, he also has a good support system from his family, and he would be 
outside of the state of Indiana. Uh, he has uh, some serious health issues as well. And the longer he uh, is incarcerated, the more those health issues will become the burden and the responsibility of the staff at the prison to care for him. That's a small factor, but it's also a factor. So for me personally, uh, my vote would be to recommend to the governor that Mr. What Cox sentence be commuted to 99 years. Thank you, Mrs. Jackson. Mr. Rushman. Thank you, Madam Chairman. First of all, I'd like to thank the family for coming and sharing with us and because a part of this process is the victim's uh, input. Into the victim's input is very important. And as the victim advocate on this board, I understand that you are still physically, mentally, and emotionally affected by the death of your loved one. But there comes a time when you have to think about yourself. As Mrs. Jackson said, you can't carry the burden of this man's crime the rest of your life because you will create a prison within itself or yourself. You have to live life to the fullest. You can't do that without forgiveness. And I'll end it then. But as a victim advocate on this board, I'd like to vote in solidarity with the family and deny Mr. Woodcock his <laughs> permits. But you must remember that you have a life to live and you cannot live it within a prison created by yourself. Thank you, Madam Chairman. So I, I'd like to likewise thank everyone for coming. We certainly hear what you have to say. Uh, Judge Jackson was very articulate pointing out what our role what we what we look for and what we have to look for. And uh, based upon what I believe my responsibility is, I agree with Judge Jackson. My most likely is going to be to recommend the governor that he uh, grant a commutation to that Mr. Freeman. Um, you know, all all our cases are difficult. And, and this one was really hard to listen to. I understand. I don't understand. I, it's never happened to me, but I'm sure there's a lot of pain and anguish that, that go through on both sides. Um, but listening to what I've heard today, uh, my vote is to commute this sentence to 99 years. All right. Um, thank you, Mr. Freeman. Mr. Rushing, you have a Mr. Woodcock, my vote today is also that to make the recommendation your sentence be commuted. That's based on your age, the length of incarceration, the fact that you're going, you have an out-of-state plan, you have the support of the parole project, and the things that uh, Warden Falvey has said on your behalf. So you received one vote that was not in favor, but four votes that were favorable. So uh, we will make the recommendation on your behalf that your sentence be commuted to 99 years. Wow, so let's unpack that, right? I gotta tell you, he uh, he looks like a, a Marine gunnery sergeant right there. Man, he looks like he could still put on that uniform and <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe the role of a drill sergeant, really. I, how do you um 
You know, I, I, uh, first I was surprised by Mr. O'Shea. I thought he was leading into pardoning because he's talking about the forgiveness and, and he doesn't usually do that. That's more like a Miss Jackson thing. But then he still said, in solidarity with the family, I'm going to deny. Now it's possible that he, he had some sense of where the voting was going and knowing that he didn't need a, a unanimous decision to get the recommendation to the governor. And remember, this is a commutation hearing. So the governor has to sign off on it. I think the likelihood would be high that the governor will sign off on it. The governor is about to leave office and it seems that this is what he's what he's doing um i also thought it was interesting and richard thank you for sharing the info is that he didn't even apply for this commutation hearing until may of this year so it's 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 uh it's, it's just interesting to me you know he's been locked up for so long four years we see so many hearings where where people have done less than 25 years and they get these commutation hearings and they even get approved recommendation to the governor. Now, sadly, there's not a lot of what Richard was able to find in terms of like court transcripts was really only for his, his co-defendant, which was his sister. And even then, there's not a lot of information on it. It's really an appeal, uh, which she actually had won. It was an appeal uh, which she won to allow her a second trial. So they, she had a trial, and there was uh, an instance in the trial that led to hearsay from one of the witnesses. And because of that, the, and the defense objected and said it's hearsay, the judge overruled and they appealed, lost the appeal, but then went to the Supreme Court and won. So she got another trial, but his sister only served 20 years, which it's just interesting to me if she's the one that had them do it and she got 20 years. And then what's also interesting is that, like they mentioned in, in this hearing, they gave his co-defendant who went in there and did it with him immunity they gave him they gave the man who was involved and maybe he didn't pull the trigger but he was involved immunity to testify that just seems like the biggest sweetheart deal i have you know uh, and They just, they don't have a lot of information. It, it says, you know, the police investigation led to the Jan, grand uh, jury indictment of Betty Cole and her brother, George Woodcock, uh, on March 25th, 1980, her first degree red room of um, Armin Cole, her estranged husband. The state theorized that Armin Cole had been um, red room by George Woodcock and his friend, Joseph Paul, upon the instructions and directions of Betty Cole. And yet Betty only got 20 years, which is, again, I'm surprised because typically they would give, if it's if it's the instructions by someone, they give them the harsh sentence, not, they don't only give the shooter. I, I'm just used to seeing the person who directs the killing to get the tougher the sentence, even sometimes tougher than the one who pulls the trigger. And they're doing it for insurance money now, Fallon, the co-defendant, was given immunity to testify against George and Betty. And uh, George was subsequently found guilty and was sentenced to life in prison. Here they go into the details about the hearsay. About the cross-examination of, of Fallon. But they don't go into any details of the crime. So there, there's really not much to go in here, but it was interesting that she won the appeal. Something also Richard brought out to my attention, which I thought was quite odd even, is that uh, Betty, his sister, passed away in 2008 at the age of 79. And she passed away, you know, f uh, free. She was out of prison by then. But her obituary lists 
It says she was preceded in the death by her husband, Armin Cole. And, and also her daughter, that's sad to lose your daughter. Uh, and it's like, how do they list? <laughs> the, it, she lists in her obituary the husband which she planned to have killed. It just seems like, what? You know, does that mean she regretted it so much, like the killing and she actually puts it in her obituary or did someone else write it and not uh, know this, the details of what had happened? I can't understand it. And another thing was brought, which they didn't really touch on here, was when they said, well, why did you do it? He said that she told him that there were kid stuff, that he was touching kids. And if that's true... If she really told him that, uh, you again would think that she should have gotten more time than he got. Um, and if it's not true, it's like that should have been something that was, which I don't believe it was true. All right, I just I'm gonna give the man who was was killed for the insurance money the benefit of the doubt is that he's being dragged through the mud. Uh, right here again all these years later 43 years later and that 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 should be something that is completely unacceptable now maybe they're saying he's saying that that's what his sister said but not that it was true just that that's what he was told uh but again it's you know you hear their family come up and speak and and like mr o'shea said they are holding i mean the pain in his voice uh, and he did seem afraid, like, what if you would go out and do it again? What if you would go and hurt another veteran uh, at the VA? And it seemed that he was genuinely concerned. And, hey, I mean, he is a big man. But I, then you look at, you do look at his record, and it's incredibly impressive now. He brought up the fact that, well, when he's out of structure, it's he gets in trouble. I, I, I got a, I, I thought that the police officer that spoke on his behalf, um, I thought that was one of the more moving pro um, release statements that we've heard in a while. You know, talking of a place of understanding the pain of losing a child and um, it felt very authentic, but I, I wish I had more information to share on this, and I'm glad that I am not on the commutation board. Mondays are tough days, as Miss Jackson said. I did not realize that Mondays were the designated days for commutation hearing. Look, we learn something new all the time, and I've been doing this for over a year. Um, never put two and two together about that, but. I, for whatever reason, found myself rooting for him. I don't know why. And um, but at the same time, again, it, it's like I didn't feel like they dived into the details so much of what it, the crime actually was. And um, if you really did it just for the insurance money, it's just so twisted. But I don't know. You tell me. You think he served enough time, 43 years? That's a long time. That is a long time. Uh, but I just, I don't know. You tell me. With that, I'll let you go.